Good morning, church. So good to see you. Have you ever been in a friendship or you think, you know, a possible friendship, but you weren't sure if the other person wanted to be in the relationship? You ever been there? Yeah, it's kind of awkward, huh? Um, Yeah, so like it kind of articulates the way I experienced uh, a lot of middle school and high school growing up. So I had a group of friends uh, who lived close by me in Waynedale, and uh, you know we did everything together. We we played all kinds of sports together. Uh, if you wanted to come to Waynedale Park and play some basketball, you came through us, okay? Because we ran that park, we ran it, and uh, you know we played all kinds of sports, played video games together, did a lot of dumb things together. Uh, you know it emboldened our relationship. You know, and, and like when I was with one of them, it was just one on one, me and him, uh, one of one of my friends. Uh, it, things were really good and really easy and all that. But have you ever been in the situation like this? Is what I felt like a lot of times, not all the time, but sometimes when we were all together. I, I, sometimes I felt like I was the one that everyone was just putting up with. You ever been there? Yeah, and so like you know, growing up, I was a very like unsure of myself, shy, uh, and, and all that, and so uh, it, it created some dynamics. You ever struggled with friendships? Uh, like I have, and 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 the thing is, you know, if you if you've been around kids, you know how easy it is for them to make friends, right? Like you, you bring a kid to a a park, and if there's like one other person, they're gonna be like best friends. After, like, after that's all done, right? Like, look at, Daddy, look at my friend. This is, they don't even know their name, but they're like friend status already, you know? And then for us as adults, as we get older, uh, you get into high school, and then you get past that into college, and then you get into the workforce or whatever you're doing. Uh, it's almost like the art of making friends is like going to the art museum, and you get to the abstract spot, and you look at it, and you're looking at this abstract painting, and you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with my hands because you're like, I don't know what that is. Hmm. But you want to look sophisticated. So you're like, okay, sure. Yeah, make friends. I'm good, you know? But really deep down, you're like, what is that? Right? You know, we, we all, a lot of us, we know the value of friendship, right? And, and many of you may even know this, this, uh, these two verses from Ecclesiastes chapter four. It says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. We understand the importance of having some friendships. And and like none of us want to be on the receiving end of the sentiment of the great theologian, Mr. T. I pity the fool who's alone, right? Like none of us want to be that guy or that gal. But, But even so, a lot of us, we struggle in our friendships, like a lot, a lot of us, we want to have more friends because we don't have too many. A lot of us, we want to have deeper friendships with the people we're friends with. But a lot of us, we don't know what that looks like. And so a lot of times we just feel like we're in survival mode when it comes to friendships. And so I believe God wants us to thrive in those relationships. So for the last uh, couple of weeks, we've been in this series called Thrive, where we're looking at how we can go from surviving to thriving in all of our relationships. Week one, we talked about the most important relationship all of us are in, is that, that your relationship with you. Like when you look at you in the mirror, and that's the most difficult relationship any of us will ever be in. And we talked about how you can thrive in that, or at least get on the path to thriving. Last week, we talked about marriage and how if you're married or if you want to be married one day, how to, to step into a thriving relationship with your spouse. And, and, and I know that that sparked a lot of conversation, uh, especially among the middle schoolers. Uh, if you were here, you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the middle schoolers said amen in their head. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, so uh, if you don't know, if you weren't here last week, ask your neighbor, they'll let you know about it and you'll want to go watch it, okay, or listen to it at the end. But today we're going to be talking about how we can thrive in our friendships. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up to uh, Colossians chapter three. That's where we're going to park today, Colossians chapter three. Um, and, and this is what I believe God wants us to see when it comes to our friendship. So Paul is speaking to the church in Colossae, and God is utilizing what he inspired Paul to say to that church, and he's saying it to us today as well. So this is what it says in Colossians 3, verse 12. It says this, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. I'm going to stop right there, 
okay? Because as we get into this space of talking about friendships, we have to understand something vitally important and what Paul is getting at here. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. Before, if you, if you read the epistles, the Paul's letters uh, to you know, Colossians and Philippians and Romans and First and Second Corinthians, all those, uh, what you'll notice is that the, there's a trend in how Paul communicates uh, to, to us and to them, that he always goes to what your theological truth is, your, your theology, then that goes to how you live. And so what he wants you to see is that your, uh, your identity in Christ makes a huge difference in how you are able to thrive in friendships. Like all of us uh, have this tendency that started in like maybe around preschool for some of us, maybe before, maybe after, give or take a year or so, when we realized that, that not all kids like us, that, that not everyone wants to be your friend, right? You, you, you've been, and you remember those days, Right, and, and so that, that created this mindset that we have with friendships because what we started to do, and uh, I, I'm sure many of us did this, was we looked at our value and our worth based on who we were friends with or weren't friends with. Like we wanted to be friends with the cool kids, right? The ones that, that, that were really cool, like you, they just, they, for whatever reason, you know, they were cool. And so if we were friends with them, then that makes us feel better about ourselves. And so we, we operate, adults, we still a lot of times operate inside of that mindset. That our worth, our value in life, our identity is shaped by who we're friends with and who we're not. We, we, we probably don't consciously have these conversations, but it's still there. But what Paul wants us to see is that you can thrive in your friendships, and here's why. Because if you follow Jesus, then you have an identity in him, not in what people think about you, not in how people talk to you, not in people with what people do to you or whether or not they're friends with you. Your identity, your ability to thrive with relationships with other people is dictated by your uh, awareness of your identity in Jesus. You ever, you ever uh, like when you were growing up, right, at school, uh, the, the, they had the, the, the captain, you got two captains because you're about to play a sport, and they needed to pick teams, right? And maybe the teams that you're picking on, you're about to play a sport that you're not very good at. Anybody been there? And you're like standing against the wall or standing right here, and you're like, oh, man, please pick me. <laughs> please pick me. You don't want to be the last one, right? You just don't. Can I get an Amen. Okay, you don't want to be like, you don't want to be the last. So, uh, you know, they start picking all the other people. And, and you know, if you're the last one, that, that says a lot about what you think they think about you, right? And, and so uh, here's, here's the reality. If you follow Jesus, God, the creator of the universe, the one who knows everything about you, knows, has, holds time and eternity in his hands, he chose you. You've been chosen. You don't have to go and seek satisfaction uh, or, or value or worth from other people. Uh, you're, you're holy. That means set apart. In other words, God said, hey, I'm putting you over here because you're special to me. You are my child, okay? You're a big deal to me. So, so big of a deal that Jesus went to the cross and died, y'all. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Why? Because you are dearly Loved, And so here's, here's the reality for all of us. We cannot uh, survive going to friendships to satisfy our insecurities. We just can't. Uh, anybody agree with me? Middle school uh, and middle schoolers, I'm sure you agree with this and you'll look back and, and you'll know. Uh, middle school is a very confusing time. Yeah, for real. Like, it was very confusing. You know, bodies changing, voices changing, uh, interests are changing, you know. Uh, and, and so it's all kinds of crazy happening all at once. And so uh, middle school teachers, we need to pray for them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? Uh, middle school youth leaders, we need to pray for them. Uh, middle schoolers, we need to pray for them. Uh, but, you know, I remember I went to uh, middle school at Miami Middle School down the road on Bluffton Road in Waynedale. And uh, I remember <laughs> it was a weird dynamic. I, I think middle school, at least for me, was like the climax of the cliques. 
You know what I'm saying? The climax of the clicks. And so at Miami, we had uh, a, a very diverse uh, uh, student body, and we had all kinds of uh, uh, different interests and different <laughs> dynamics in it. And uh, I remember, like, it was just so weird. Like, we had the wannabe gangsters. We had the preppy kids. We had the, the, the sporty guys, you know, and gals. We had the band members and everyone. And, and there was just all these different groups inside of middle school. I don't know if you guys had that kind of a dynamic, but that's what it was at Miami. And so I remember like I would be in the wannabe gangster group, right? Okay, that was me. Yo, in middle school, I, I had a lot of swag, okay? <laughs> Swagger, you know, just like brush your shoulders off. So some of y'all will know that, some of you won't, it's okay. Uh, so like because of that, right? Uh, but also because I'm kind of like a more social person, I like to kind of like, you know, like be a butterfly, hang out with everyone. And you know, I was, a, I was part of the band, part of sports. Uh, and, and then like I, I messed, messed with my friends, uh, it messed with them, I didn't mean for it to, but um, what ended up happening is I, uh, about like once or twice a day a week, um, I would start wearing some preppy clothes. <laughs> Y'all, and my friends were like, Brandon, what are you doing? That's not who you are, man. You know, like that shirt's too small, you know? <laughs> That's just not gonna work. And, and so, okay, fast forward, y'all. So this, that was like middle school, uh, kind of happened in eighth grade. And so uh, summer of between eighth grade and freshman year, my group of friends, they must have went back to school shopping without me uh, and all coordinated together because I show up to Wayne High School freshman year, you know, and I'm, I'm wearing my swag clothes and, and they show up and they're all wearing preppy clothes. I'm like, what are you guys doing? You got upset with me, what are you doing? I'm a trendsetter, didn't even know it, you know what I mean? But here's the reality like that we all kind of operate in. Uh, there's rules within every group that you have to uh, kind of like live by in order to be accepted into the group. And it's had an, a crazy, uh, crazy level in middle school, at least it was for me. And because I was unsure of myself, because I was someone who just wanted to kind of be a part of the crowd, uh, I, I just kind of tried to play by the rules. Uh, this, I just like my, the way I talked would change. Like, want to be gangster? I'd talk that way. Preppy, I'd talk that way. Sports, I'd talk that way. Band, I'd talk that way. Like, I just, the way I communicated would change because I'm just trying to fit in because I didn't know the truth of the reality of what we are called to as Christ followers because I didn't know Jesus back then is that when your identity in Christ is secure, thriving friendships can occur. When your identity in Christ is secure, thriving friendships can occur. And here's why. When you have your identity in Christ secure, when you know who you are in Jesus, that you are loved and adored and cared for, and you don't have to go to anybody else to receive a kind of a validation of who you are as a person, then you can freely love. You don't have to be so offended all the time. You can, you can be unoffended, not insecure. A lot of us, like because of our insecurities, because we're not dealt with the man in the mirror or the woman in the mirror, that's what keeps us from having thriving friendships. Has he got not dealt with that person? And so all of us, we have these dynamics that get in the way of us thriving with other people. And, and what, what God wants us to do is to have our posture toward friendship change. Because a lot of us, we look for satisfaction, we look for our worth, our value through our friendships. Like we want our friends to, to encourage us and make us feel better about ourselves. And that's a good thing. And like, if that's what happens, they encourage you. But that's not our source of encouragement. That's not our source for endurance. That's not our source for worth. They are not. Because how, how many of you know? The friends you have today may not be the friends you have tomorrow. Because people are people. And so we cannot attach our identity to people. And thriving, a thriving friendship begins with surrendering to Jesus. If you've not done that, then you have to understand what Jesus wants to do is to undo all the things that sin has done to you and in you and the way you think. He wants to undo all the things that get you uh, in, in your own way in your relationships. He wants you to be whole, not only in your relationship with him, but in your relationship with people. What did Mike say earlier? That he quoted John 13. Jesus said, they'll know that you're my disciples by the way you what? By the way you, by the way you love. And so what would it look like then for us to step into that space 
It begins with us surrendering to Jesus because we are dead and broken. We are spiritually dead without him. And only he will be able to raise us up to new life so that we can thrive in our friendships. But here's what it breaks down practically. So uh, Paul goes on in, in verse 12. I'll read the whole thing again. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, you have to remember that that is who you are in Jesus. Then he says this, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So, so from the first half of this verse, we see that we, we need not be a, a offended. We can be unoffended. In other words, like what people do to you or say to you, they don't need to offend you because you're not insecure because of your relationship with Jesus. And what I see him saying here, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, that's an outward focus on the other person. In other words, we need to be interested, not always try to be interesting. So if, if you were to put on compassion, what would that require of you? It re- would require you to, have to take an interest in someone's feelings, right? You would have to be interested in them. To, to put on kindness, you'd have to be interested in their dignity and the fact that they are someone made in the image of God. And you'd have to interest, have, the, have that interest. If you wanted to put on humility, <laughs> you have to take an interest in their thoughts and opinions. You can't just always be sharing yours. If, if you want to put on gentleness, then you have to take an interest in the way they receive things from you, right? When we really care, we care about how they receive it because communication is a two-way street. If you want to put on patience, what would that require of you to take an interest in the person and the fact that they operate at a different pace than you? Type A people, all y'all who are taking notes right now, trying to evaluate whether the outline of my sermon makes sense, uh, you know, keeping a track of time, type A, you work at a different pace than somebody else does. And we have to take an interest in them and love them enough to meet them where they are. So be interested, not just interesting. I got a couple friends, Sarah and I have a couple friends in Cincinnati who they do this so well. Uh, you know, they, they care about us. They ask us questions. They take an interest in what our life is like. And, and you know what? Because they're interested in what's going on in our world, they, they love to ask for my opinion on things, which is so fun, you know? Uh, uh, you know, it's just so, you all love your own opinions, don't you? Uh, amen. You can admit it. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and so they, they ask us questions. They take an interest in us. And you know what it makes that, that, that relationship works because we then take an interest in them. And when you take an interest in someone else, guess what happens? You become interesting. You, you could have lunch with someone for the very first time, say about 10 words, and if they're all questions, you'll be the most interesting person they've ever met because you just let them talk and share. And there's something deeply Jesus-like in that. Jesus asked all kinds of questions, didn't he? People ask him a question, he respond with a question. Kind of frustrating, right? But he'd take an interest in them. He'd have compassion on them. And so that would change our experience as friends, right? Like instead of us trying to make everything about ourselves, instead of always trying to have our opinion be exuded, instead of always trying to make every conversation come back to our own experiences, our own things, our own opinions, what if we could take an interest in them and put on kindness and compassion And Paul goes on, he says this in verse 13. He says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So how many of you know that friendship can be difficult? We've established that. Sometimes uh, people, uh, may, I'm sure this is not you uh, in this room, right? But sometimes we use our friends. We use our friends to, to curb our loneliness, right? They're just around to meet an end so that we don't feel lonely anymore. Some of us use our friends to have our own opinions and our own uh, issues reaffirmed to us that it's okay, it's a very destructive thing when you use a friend so that they would, you, you want them to encourage you in your own sin. It's a real bad thing. 
Some of us use our friends so that we could feel better about ourselves. And we're not really interested in the friendship. We're just interested in what they're giving us. And we're taking it. So using our, y'all, that's not love. When we are willing to uh, lie to our friends so that they would maybe feel better, that is not love, y'all. You see, love is truthful. And some people call it tough love. I just call it real love. Because, because we need to be people who, we are in this for real. I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little bit older. Tomorrow I turn 30, okay, you know? <laughs> it's the oldest I've ever been, okay? <laughs> Judge me, I don't care. I don't want the fake stuff anymore. I'm just over it, right? I want the real friendship stuff, the deeper stuff, the real stuff, where you can tell me the truth and I can tell you the truth and we can love each other through it. Imagine, what if we didn't have to be offended? What if we could be unoffended, not insecure? What if we could be interested and not always just trying to be interesting because we're trying to tote ourselves up and boast? See, love is truthful. This is what Proverbs 27, five through six says. Better an open reprimand than concealed love. The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. We could chew on that for a couple days. Better an open reprimand than concealed love. If you love somebody, if you care for someone, let them know. Let them know. And if you're friends with someone, I mean, you are so blessed. If you've got a friend who will tell you the truth, even when you don't want to hear it in a loving way. Like it's a blessing when you've got a friend who will, who will identify something you are blind to, some kind of sin in your life, because they care enough not to condemn you, but they care enough to get you on the right track in following Jesus. Right? That's some good friend stuff. That's the real stuff. And, and really, when we are, are having a posture of giving and not taking, of, of giving a hand, what does he say in verse 13? Bearing with one another. Like some of us, we're gonna need help at, at times in life, right? We're just gonna, gonna need to give a hand. What if you were the friend who would always give a hand? What else does he say? Forgiving one another. There are gonna be times when you and your friend have a disagreement. Or, or they do something to you to hurt you. What if, what if we could give forgiveness just like we've been given it by Jesus? Like that would, that would be a game changer. For those of you who have close friends, you know how many times you've had to ask for forgiveness and give forgiveness, right? Without it, it doesn't work. Because we're people and we're broken. And we have a tendency to hurt people. If anyone has a grievance against another, that, y'all, you can't reach forgiveness if you're not truthful. If your relationship doesn't involve truth, you can't have forgiveness. You have to be honest with each other. And what else does he say? Above all, put on love. Put on love. You see, when we are freed up to love our friends like Jesus loves us and that Jesus loves them, then that, that changes everything. When you are secure in your identity in Christ, thriving friendships can occur, but not until then. Not until then, because there will always be a place where you will not go because you will look at your friendship as a transaction, as I will give you just as much as you give me, or not anymore. We all operate in this. We have a tendency to, don't we? But what if we were freed up because we were so full of the Holy Spirit, because we were so satisfied in our relationship with Jesus that we could love with an open hand. Imagine the kind of friend you would be to the people around you. That would be the friend you want, where they can love you in all the ways we need to be. You see, you, know, you may, may be wondering, like, Brandon, just give me like three things. To, to, so I can make new friends and deepen my friendships. Anybody be interested in that? You can admit it, it's fine, it's fine. Like, give me some practical stuff, right? Three things, okay. All right, no one wants it, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway, okay? Here we go. I've already referred to it, but we're gonna take a Jesus-like posture to making new friends and deepening our existing friendships. We're gonna, we're gonna be unoffended, not insecure, because we get our security not from our friends, but from the one who created us. 
Because he loves us, he has compassion on us, he adores us, he cares for you, and he chose you and set you apart. So we're, we're unoffended, not insecure, and we take it another step and we're interested, not interesting. I challenge you, like you, you have, have lunch or coffee with someone you've never had lunch or coffee with. And let me just challenge you. Like, just ask a bunch of questions. Ask a bunch of questions. Be interested. So oftentimes we get with people and we're, we're trying to just share our stuff, our thoughts, our opinions, our experiences that we never give them a chance to talk. I'm serious. Like if you just, if you, if you said, hey, community group, you're gonna be challenged. Community groups are gonna be challenged this week to get together outside of your regular meeting time. But here's what I wanna encourage you to do is maybe go up to one other person in your community group and say, hey, can we get lunch together? Can we get uh, a coffee together, a tea, whatever, Coca-Cola, whatever you want. And here's, at the end of the day, you have to be willing to hear the word no. You just have to. Uh, there's, there's a principle throughout scripture that uh, relates to so many things. And it's called sowing and reaping. Uh, many of us, we have no friends or we don't have good friendships because we're not sowing seeds of relational seeds. We're not sowing it. How are you gonna expect it to just happen? God wants us to sow relational seeds. So what if you just said, hey, you wanna get together? It'd be great. And then when you got together, you can see who can ask the most questions. It'd be like a little competition. And it'd be great. Be interested, not interesting, because when you're interested, you'll become interesting. And the third thing is be a giver, not a taker. Give a hand, give forgiveness, give love, give Jesus. Give Jesus. See, see the direction of a thriving relationship with other people is in the direction of Jesus. Jesus. Because when, you're, when your uh, identity in Christ is secure, then thriving friendships can occur. There was this uh, time where Jesus was teaching in a house, and the house was just full. Like, no one could get in, uh, and, and there was this group of friends. And, and if you grew up in church, you read the Bible a little bit, you may have heard this story. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Jesus was, was talking to all these people, teaching and, and doing all these things at somebody's house. And this group of friends carrying their paral paralyzed friend come up. Uh, to the door, and they knock on the door. The bouncer comes out and said, "Hey, man, you're not on the list. Sorry, there was no bouncer. I mean, we don't know that. It'd be cool if there was a bouncer, though, right? It'd be kind of fun. Uh, but anyway, they just couldn't get in. They just couldn't get into the house. And their houses back then, they had stairs that went up the out on the outside of the house up to the roof. Okay, so these guys had a bright idea. They wanted to get their friend to Jesus. So they said, "All right, we ain't getting through the door. So we're gonna go up the steps and we're gonna get on the roof." Because maybe they just wanted to start the party on the roof, you know? But no, that's not what they did, y'all. <laughs> oh, man, if you just picture this. These friends put their friend down, he's on the mat, and they started ripping the roof up. They started destroying this guy's house. Can you imagine the roof just opening up? Imagine being the homeowner. Like, hey, man, what are you doing? I'll let you in. I'll tell the bouncer to let you in. Come on. But they, they come up with this pulley system. Like these were some bright people, okay? Uh, they're like engineers, right? Uh, and, and so they get their friend down in front of Jesus. They ripped open the roof and they get their friend to Jesus. And Jesus forgives this guy of, their, of his sins, heals him. The guy gets up, runs out the house and singing and praising God all the way home. Y'all, here's the thing with friendships. What if... We could take a, a look at these, these guys who got their friend to Jesus as an example of what a truly thriving friendship could look like. Because the direction of a truly thriving relationship with friends is getting them to Jesus. They stopped at nothing. They ripped the roof off, you know, insurance. I don't know if it was covering it, you know? <laughs> guys might've got sued, but it was worth it because they were getting their friend to Jesus. Y'all, if you want to be a truly great friend that when, some, when, you're on, when you are dead and gone and you are at your funeral and you've got people in the room who, who want to share, if you want to be the person who has people wanting to share about your life, then be the friend who will always get them to Jesus. Because then somebody will come up and say, you know what, I love them so much 
They, they were always interested in me. They were always just, they would forgive me. They understood that I messed up and they loved me through that. They were always just willing to give a hand, give their forgiveness, give love to me. And you know, I was not even close to a, as good of a friend to them as they were to me, but you know what? They loved me so much and I will, I'm so grateful to God that they loved me so much to get me to Jesus because now for eternity, I have hope. For, for eternity, I have hope. Why? Because my friend loved me enough to tell me the truth, to be honest with me, and to get me to Jesus. They worked with me through it. They told me when I was straying off the path, and they repeatedly got me back to Jesus. I'm so grateful for them. Imagine someone at your funeral saying that about you. But it begins today. It begins today. What if you and I could look at the people we're in relationship with, the friends that we have and the friends that we don't have, the friends we want to have, have enough boldness and courage to say, hey, you want to get together because that's where it begins. And, and then to invest, to be interested. Imagine what it would be like to be the friend you've always desired who would lead you to Jesus. Can you imagine what that would be like? I'd be a game changer. You'd be a friend that everyone is thankful to have. So here, here's what uh, our homework is today. Not only do we need to get to Jesus, we need to, we need to invest in our walk with God. We need to start seeing ourselves as made in his image to where we are so uh, just over come with the word of God, with the words of Jesus, that we understand who we are in him, and then we can preach that sermon to ourselves in the mirror, on the, on the road, at work, in, in the lunch line, whatever it is, that we can continue preaching that to ourselves so that we don't see ourselves uh, finding our value and worth and, and value from someone else, but we find it through Jesus, and then we can be freed to love somebody else. So invest in your relationship with God. And for those of you who are not following Jesus, I want to encourage you, like, Jesus is everything. He's the king. And he wants you to be whole. He doesn't want you to be enshackled to other people's opinions. He wants you to know who you are in him. And so for those of you who are in a community group, uh, you can testify to, to just how, if and there's anyone in here who's not a part of a community group, you need to change that. Just get involved. Fill out your connection card, put it in the metal box at the back. We'll get in touch with you and, and get you involved in a group. For those of you who are in a group, you're gonna be challenged this week, as I said earlier, to, to invest in your relationship with each other outside of a regular meeting. And I'd encourage you again, maybe, maybe ask one person, hey, you wanna get together? And just invest. Be interested in your relationship with them. It's a perfect way, because we, we are all about community groups here to help you with your relationship with God, to help you with your relationship with people. Because I'm, we're, we're giving you a group to call you friends. Invest, dig in, and be interested. At the end of the day, church, we have to sow some relational seeds if we want to have good friendships. And let's get them to Jesus. Because that is what will make our friendships thrive. Let's pray.